welcome to today's session, everyone. My name is Trinity, and I'm a member of Pre-Med CC, which is a student-led organization that was established in fall of 2021. Our goal as an organization was to create an online program for pre-medical students at community colleges and universities with the hope of guiding the next generation of diverse and inclusive physicians. And while we advertise our organization as being for community college students, uh, our events are open to anyone who wants to join. We realize finding mentorship and guidance in a pre-med journey can be especially challenging for first-generation students, people that lack the financial resources, or just people that don't know anyone in the medical field. One of the, one of the best parts about our events is that they are virtual, so you can join us from the comfort of your own home or wherever you happen to be. Uh, for the summer, our events are typically Wednesday nights from 5 to 6.30 PST, and then uh, Saturdays from 11 to 12.30 PST. But be sure to check our website to uh, confirm those times and you can get email reminders as well. So after you have attended our event, you can log in onto our website and take the quiz. And if you score a 70% or higher on the quiz, you can get credit uh, for attending our session today and any other session that we have as well. And last but not least, if you wanna stay connected with us on all of our upcoming events, uh, and spread the word with your friends. You can follow us at PremedCC at, on all of the platforms you see here. So uh, be sure to do that and you can stay up to date and know what's coming down the pipeline. So I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hand it over to Ileana who's going to get introduce our speaker. Good morning. I'm Ileana. I'm uh, also a member of the leadership team here at PremedCC. Our speaker today is Alexandra Dubinin. Um, she's a fourth year medical student at UC San Diego School of Medicine and a former community college student. As a current community college student, I'm really excited to hear all of her wonderful advice and we're really excited to have her today. Thank you so much. Let me just load my presentation. I assume everyone can hear me okay and can see my screen. All right. Uh, so just as a preface, uh, this is meant to be interactive. Please feel free to interrupt me at any point, ask questions. Um, I also wanna say I've given this presentation a few times and being pre-med is very anxiety inducing. This presentation is very anxiety inducing because what I hope to do is I'm gonna lay out essentially what the application looks like in the format that they're gonna give it to you and then talk about your journey and what you should be thinking about for every step. So even if you're four years away from applying, it'll get you a sense of what the, you're gonna eventually, what the end product is because the application is how you sell yourself and pitch yourself to med schools. Um, so it's good to keep in mind what they're looking at, what the format's like, even though there might be slight changes by the time you apply. Um, but it, it is anxiety inducing and it's stressful. And I'm gonna give a lot of advice. A lot of this, some of this advice is coming from other people. I didn't even take, cause honestly, it's really hard to be the perfect pre-med candidate. And a lot of times like there's really no such thing. There's a million and one things you can do to help your application look better. Um, but if you miss one of those, you're gonna be okay. There are things in this PowerPoint that I'm advising because other people have told me it's really helpful, but I didn't actually do because I didn't know about it or I wasn't on top of it. So I just want everyone to take a deep breath. If you realize there's something that you should have done last year that you didn't do and it would be helpful, it's okay. There are people apply to med school from all kinds of backgrounds and different circumstances. So this is just the like tip sheet that hopefully is helpful. But again, I try not to dwell on any one point, it's really a holistic application process. Okay, just wanted to put that disclaimer out because honestly, I get re-stressed talking about this sometimes because it is like, it's a lot. All right, this is a marathon. So let's get started. Um, already mentioned uh, a little bit about myself. I am a former community college student. I went to Santa Rosa Junior College. Um, it was amazing. I feel like I learned a ton. Community college students um, actually have a lot of opportunity to learn their stuff really well because their class sizes are small. Um, transferred over to Berkeley, worked for a few years at UCSF, and now I'm here at UCSD. So I'm a very much UC person. If you have questions about any of these institutions, free, feel free to personal message me and I can give you my contact information. 
All right, let's get started with the timeline. Um, and I am not going to be checking the chat all that much. So please, someone let me know if there's a chat that's relevant or if you're brave enough. I, I promise I'm nice. Feel free to interrupt me. All right. When you're done, yeah, when you're done, we'll just go through the chat questions. Okay. If there's something that's immediately relevant, though, feel free to interrupt. Yeah, we'll interrupt, we'll interrupt you. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Here's the full timeline. You're probably somewhere in this range, the undergrad years. Then there's the med school years, residency, and plus or minus a fellowship. So we're going to focus right now on undergrad because it's most relevant for you guys. So zooming in on the undergrad, if you're a community college student, it's actually split into two sections. You got pre-transfer and post-transfer. Um, so we're going to start with the pre-transfer, what you should be thinking about during this time. So as I mentioned, we're going to be going step by step along the AMCAS application. Uh, fun fact, most pre-meds apply to 15 to 25 schools. I've heard of people applying to as many as 50. It's, that's crazy. You're not going to get through all the secondaries, and I'll talk about secondaries. So aim for 15 to 25 schools. Fortunately, there's a common app all through AMCAS, with the exception of a few Texas schools. Um, so it does make it easier, but it does cost money. So we'll talk about that. So let's sign in and get started. All right, this is the overall application um, timeline. So usually people are gonna wanna take their MCAT early on in the year. Submissions for MCAS begin on May 31st and you want to try to get um, your submission as soon as possible because things are somewhat rolling. Um, for the MCAT, usually scores are released a month early. So realistically, you don't really wanna be taking your MCAT in the middle end of May, you ideally have taken it before then, but it's possible. Um, a theme that you're gonna see is there's what, sh what the best practice is, and then there's a lot of possible, and it'll work. Not the best, but it'll work. And you can see that here in this timeline. All right, so now here are the sections of the AMCAS, and we're gonna go through each of them. So this is the most intuitive and obvious part. You're gonna talk about just, general identification, what schools did you attend, some biographic information, a couple of tips for this section. Um, there are going to be options where you can decline to respond to things. Try not to do that because you, unless there's like a personal, very sensitive reason, because it looks like you're being cagey and not honest. Um, so even though it's in there, it's kind of a trap. Try not to use that unless it's really, really something you're sensitive about, in which case they're going to be understanding of that. Um, try to be really honest about your language proficiency. That's a common pitfall. If you say you speak Spanish fluently, you should speak Spanish fluently because there's a good chance for, depending on the language, but even some of the smaller, like less common languages, you could get an interviewer who's going to see that and will start talking to you in Spanish. And if you can't keep up with it, it's not going to look right. So that's a common pitfall. The other thing, random thing is know your parents' highest level education, what school they went to. Um, if you have an international parent like mine, it's, it can be really interesting to find their school. Okay, for everyone who is in college right now, this is probably the most relevant, especially if you're in community college right now. So these are the subject requirements. Um, there's a few basic requirements that are true for essentially all med schools, biology, gen chem, organic chemistry, physics, English. Then there's also recommended subjects. Now, We'll talk about it later. Some schools actually require a couple of the recommended section uh, subjects, though it really, really depends. So unfortunately, it's not. Uh, you'll have to do a little bit of research. Um, but here's the recommended subjects. Of these subjects, the ones in orange, psychology, sociology, physiology, are ones that are crazy helpful. I mean, crazy helpful for your uh, MCAT. I have known people who to fail the MCAT two to three times because they didn't take sociology, psychology seriously. They never took it um, before. And it's tragic because their other scores were all fine. So super helpful for your MCAT. The subjects in green, I'm going to say are super helpful for med school. If you've taken those subjects, depending on your major, you're going to be ahead of your class in med school and physiology as well. It's a, it seems like a no brainer, but actually most people in my med school class have never taken physiology. I had, and I think my first year was like way more enjoyable because of that, because you have a good framework. So if you can take physiology, almost no med schools require it, but it's probably the best class to take in terms of preparing you for med school, which is I think kind of intuitive. 
um, you will have to, on the application itself, actually input every single class and every single grade that you've ever taken slash earned. So just be prepared for that. Um, have a good Netflix show on in the background. And uh, if you are in community college right now thinking about transferring, assist.org is um, what you use to determine which of the classes will transfer to a particular university. Um, so I believe you just log on, put in your community college, put in the universities you're trying to transfer to. Sometimes community college will have multiple physics classes, so it's kind of important, uh, or multiple gen, gen chem, o chem classes, depending on the like level of math that you completed. So it's important to keep, keep note of that. Um, I want to talk about something that's kind of unpleasant, not very fun, grades. They matter to an extent. And what I mean by that is um, the most important thing with grades is to show that you have an upward tra trajectory. So you can see the graph here. That's just to remind you, the most important thing is your grades continue to go up. And this can be pretty challenging for community college students because sometimes you're so overwhelmed with the transfer process and living in a new place. Um, and, and it's kind of, it's really mean that they expect you to continue to have your grades go up. But whatever you can do that first quarter when you, when you transfer to keep your grades up is super important. Because if it looks like your grades were great, 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 you transfer and they kind of tank, it's gonna make it's gonna make everyone question your community college education. But if you keep your grades where they are or even improve them after you transfer, then everyone's like, wow, their community college really prepared them for the transferring. So it's an unfortunate thing to try to keep an eye on. But the good thing about this, if you're someone who didn't know what they wanted to do, maybe are going back to school, didn't take school seriously at some point or another, and you had some not so great grades, as long as you can show that your grades improved significantly and are continuing to improve, um, that's actually not a huge issue because people understand things happen. You have, uh, your life happens. So there's both good and bad to that. I want to talk a little bit just about some strategies because if there's one thing I feel like I've done a lot of in my life is take tests. Um, so here's how I study for classes. It may not work for you, but just a general kind of organization strategy. I like to think of classes in two broad categories. See, you've got memorization classes. That's your biology, psychology. You know, you're just learning a lot of information. It's not so conceptual, just like, you know, when you see this, think this. And then there's your concept classes. That's, you know, classically chemistry, physics, math. Um, those, all the memorizing in the world won't help, help you get a good grade because it's more based on the concepts and it's word problems and usually involving more math. Um, so there's two broad categorizations of classes and how I approach these classes are different. Um, if you're getting good grades, you can just tune me out at this point. Um, but I also find this ridiculously helpful for med school. Um, so a lot of people get to med school and still don't know their study strategy and how, how to study for things in med school. I mean, the, the, they talk about drinking through a fire hose and it's, it's not exactly a joke. Um, so when I think about memorization classes, there's two things I wanna do. I wanna have a rapid fact memorization strategy. And that's something like Quizlet, Anki, something that I just, you know, constantly, I can quickly access on my phone and remind myself, oh yeah, when, um, you know, what are the base pairs in DNA, ATGC, just quick memorization, little fun facts. But if you only do that, you're gonna have a clutter of disconnected information. So what's really important is a lot of people do this part, but they don't do the second part. And that is an in-context memorization strategy. And what I mean by that is concept cards, um, notes where you actively engage with it. So I'm gonna show you one of my notes. This may not work for you, but this is something that I've done throughout uh, my education is where I rewrite my notes usually after the lecture and I put in blanks and then write the answers in the corner or I do it on flashcards, you know, write a concept like, oh, salivary gland, physiology, histology. That's my concept. And then I write everything I need to know about it with questions and then on the back with answers. So that way, when I review things, I am actively, not just passively reading my notes, but actively engaging in it. But then also um, seeing all of it in context. Cause if I just like, you know, what are, what kind of cells are in the tongue? I'll ask them, all right, if you're just kind of learning random little facts, um, it's hard to sometimes put things together for a test. Um, concept classes though, are very different. Again, that strategy, memorizing things will only get you so far. Um, so this is where study groups are incredibly helpful, working with people who uh, understand different concepts than you do. 
re-listening to the lectures is really helpful as well. I used to listen to them in my car. You're not gonna look as happy as that person, but it's a great way to learn things. Um, and then practice problems. I mean, practice, practice, practice is definitely um, the name of the game for concept classes. I would try to just do a whole bunch of extra um, in math, chemistry, I would do all the problems that weren't even assigned because they just, they help you so much. Okay, and then the other thing to think about are just general study strategies that will help you with any class, no matter whether they're memorization or concept classes. And these are things like setting goals. Um, try to early on think about what, what do you need to accomplish before the next exam? You need to go over your notes, you need to write your notes, um, whatever it is that works for you. Um, sleep, super important. We talk about it all the time in medicine about how like study, there's so many studies that show your exam scores improve if you get eight, nine hours of sleep or like, let's be six or seven, like if you're getting actual sleep all the time, you, your study scores are just so much, your uh, test scores are so much better than if you pull all nighters frequently. Um, we talk about our medicine, yet now none of us actually have time to sleep, so it's kind of funny. Um, reviewing your slides is always helpful. Reviewing what the lecture talks about, and then study environment matters. Um, I'm a big cat person. If you haven't picked up on it, these are my cats. And um, find somewhere where you can study quietly that works for you, and go back to that place. All right, that was my little soapbox about grades, just because it's something I'm passionate about. I feel like we. No one ever teaches you how to study. They just expect you to know it. Um, and that's kind of something that I figured out in the many, many, many embarrassing years that I have spent studying for tests. Somebody had a question. Uh -huh. um, should I focus on fixing my bad grades in my early years or should I focus on getting good grades in my future classes? Um, if you have to, I don't know if you'd have to, if you're retaking those classes, um, is that what you mean by fixing them? Um, yeah, I think it's by going, because you can't fix after you get a grade in the class. You could retake your class. So I think, yes, that's, it's basically, I think it's retaking. retaking classes. I mean, assuming you passed, I would say no, um, as long as you can show that your grades are improving with time. That's the most important. I mean, there, you know, some schools will be upset about your bad grades, but overall, most schools, if they see that your, your grades are improving over time, are going to be understanding and will it won't be as big of a deal. Um, so I, I could tell you in California at the community college, UC and CSU level, if you get a C in a class, it, it's, you literally have to like petition to retake that class. Mm -hmm. um, like you have to have some really good experience, like good good reason why you want to retake a class. If you get a D and F, yes, you, you have to retake the class because you don't get any credit for it. So um but always look forward rather than backwards. Yeah, I haven't heard of people. I, I don't know that it would help you much to retake the class. But yeah. Be yeah, because the grades, the, the new grades won't replace the old one. I'll just exactly. calculate it. Exactly. Um, but again, try not to dwell on the past. Move on from the past. Try to do better. Things happen and again, upward trajectory. There was another question. Why is it important to know a parent's level of education? That's a great question. It's on the application. I didn't design the application. I just remember being stumped by it. Um, I don't know. <laughs> so in, in a lot of education theory and research, they say like the biggest factor of student success, it's parents level of education, in, uh, zip code and then income. Sure. And so they collect, so WAFC is a big, they collect a lot of data. So parents' level of education actually is like a big factor of success. And so. But, but uh, for the individual student, I don't think they're going to penalize you either way. Yeah, it doesn't hurt you at all. It just, the, it's just like they ask you for your ethnicity and zip code. It's just data they collect. Yeah, I wouldn't stress about it. There are other things that they could pick on and, and deny you an admission. Parents' level of education is not one of them. No. Okay, moving on to after transferring. Um, so still going through the application, but here are the things that you really start need to worry about once you've transferred. All right, so we made it from coursework to work activities section. 
Um, there's always a ton of questions about this section. Should I do this? What about this? When should I start this? Um, there's a, this is really designed to make you stand out as your unique self. There's no formulaic way to do this. Um, so just try to have a diverse, diverse array of experiences. Um, yeah, let me just start with what the section implies, what, what you need to do for this section. So here you can list up to 15 extracurricular activities, um, 700 characters for each. And then you can highlight three of them as being most meaningful. You have slightly more of a character limit to talk about them. Um, so like general advice, because this is super variable for every, every uh, student, is to try to have some patient care and some research and, and just here are the 18, there's 18 different categories you can choose from. So you're not gonna have all the categories. No one's expecting you to have all the categories, but try to have a, you know, a decent array of category, different categories. Um, you don't wanna be someone with only artistic endeavors because then they're gonna be like, well, why are you applying to art school? You should, why are you gonna apply to med school? Um, but just try to have, I think generally, just try to have a, a kind of broad um, number of categories fulfilled. Most important though, is to make sure you have patient care and research. Um, if you're lacking in one, if you do a lot of research, but not a lot of patient care, then they're gonna be like, well, why don't you wanna be a, um, a PhD or a scientist? You don't seem like you're interested in patient care. But if you only do patient care, then um, there'll be questions. There's a lot of research involved in medicine. They like to see it. So um, the biggest advice for this section is just try to have a little bit of each. And, um, Otherwise, I think pre-transfer, try if you can show one or two that you've done one or two of these, that's great. It's really hard to get research before you transfer. I wouldn't, if you can get it, that's amazing. If you can't, I wouldn't stress too much. That's something that's a lot easier to do once you transfer. Um, but community service you can do while you're in community college. Um, there's a number of other pa paid employment and not everyone has time to, or the financial ability to, take time off to volunteer, but that counts as well, especially if you can do it in, a, in the medical setting. That's amazing. Um, Somebody else? had a question, should you join student politics offices? That would, I, that would, I, let's see, what research, what would that count as? That's probably listed as Yeah, so political office, politics, it's actually a really big thing in medicine right now because, um, you know, politics, it's, it's power. And so, um, so yeah, so it's a big part of it. So if you're the president of your uh, community college student body, or uh, actually, I know a couple of people that ran for local political office. And so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's a, it, politics requires you to listen to people and uh, negotiate and take, you know, directive and come up with policy. So yeah, it's a great thing. Yeah. Another question was with working as an EMT count as patient care experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, for patient care experience, there's a number of things you can do. So working um, would absolutely count. Um, other things for people who don't have time to work, or um, I know ED scribes is a common um, thing to do, but then you have to take a year or two off and commit to it. Um, but if for what I did, because I didn't, I was more on a research side, is in-home caregiving. I lived with some, with an older lady with dementia, Alzheimer's. That was my um, biggest uh, medical experience. It wasn't all that official, but I learned a lot from it. It was just someone, an older lady in my community that um, I spoke her language. Uh, so it can, this can be very broad. If you can justify that you've worked with patients, it counts as a medical opportunity. There's a lot of like uh, stress about shadowing. It's really hard to do. And it's not just that doctors don't want you to shadow, but there's all, the problem is there's all this legal, um, legal stuff that gets in the way, especially at big hospitals. It's hard to just, you know, shadow for a day because um, of HIPAA concerns. So if you try to shadow, it's still encouraged but it is really tough. Some tips about shadowing. Um, if you have grandparents, if you have anyone in your family that goes to a doctor, accompany them, talk to that doctor. A lot of times the smaller community private practice doctors will be more willing and more able um, because they have less uh, constraints to let you shadow them. So that's a good way to kind of get your uh, foot in the door. I do not have any doctors in the family. 
Um, so I am very sympathetic. And I know it's really hard when you don't have like connections in the medical field, but that's a great way. That's what I did. I like, you know, shadowed my family, my family's primary care. Um, you don't have to do, don't, you know, they're, they're gonna, you can list hours for this. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Just make sure you have some hours. The most important thing is you need to be able to justify that you know what it's like to take care of patients. Did yeah, have- I think one of the things is uh, hospice care is actually something that anybody can do and it's minimal training. So anything that you do that, that you're around patients and involved, do there's that? some sort of training that you have to do. And yeah. so like hospice care, it's, I think it's like 20 hours yeah. that you, and you're not like really doing, um, you're just interacting with a lot of patients and, mm-hmm. and, um, and there's a lot of, uh, but what, what the Alexandra said, first of all, um, healthcare in America is one of the most uh, litigious and legal constrictions for people to do that, to go in a hospital uh, because of HIPAA and all these like different rules and liabilities. Like what if you slip and fall and break your hip? Who's really responsible? And now because of COVID, like, you know, um, you know, if you get COVID, who's responsible to pay for your care if you're really sick? And so, uh, so it's just been, it's, it's a huge challenge. And so we actually had a whole session about this and I'll put the link in the chat. Oh, awesome. Yeah. You have to be creative with this. You're allowed to be and encouraged to be creative with this section. I've also heard of do, being becoming a doula, which um, to help like women in labor. Yeah. We actually had that whole awesome. session talked yeah. about in our clinical yeah, experience. Definitely reference that. It's important. They definitely want to see that. It could be a problem if you have no patient interaction whatsoever, but there's a lot of different opportunities. And if you can, um, this is something you possibly can start doing in um, before transfer as well. Um, let's see, I wanted to note um, an important thing here is to make sure that a couple of your activities here are a longer term commitment, at least a year. If it looks like you do a lot of things for a month, that's a lot less meaningful than a few things for a year. So don't feel like you have to make the 15 extracurriculars. That's the maximum. What's more meaningful is having ones that you've actually really committed to and spent a fair amount of time. So if you have 15 where you spent a year with a, a number of experiences where you spent a significant amount of time, that's fine. But if you don't make it to 15, I don't think I did. That's also perfectly normal as long as what you're doing is a significant commitment. Um, you could add things like uh, any time you, if you have a publication, if you have any honors, awards, you can combine those all. You don't have to make them at their own section. Um, I have an example right here in the next slide of what these kind of look like. Uh, so this is an example of one of the most meaningful sections. Um, so this one's actually a little bit longer. You can see here the experience description is kind of short, but then when you choose three most meaningful, it opens up this larger section where you can write more. Um, so as you can see here, they're going to ask you about the experience type. So that's the category. Then they're going to ask you some contact information. Make sure it's like someone legit. They're probably not going to check, but they might randomly cold call a couple people. So make sure it's someone mostly up to date who would know you and not just be entirely confused when you call, but you don't really have, it's not like a job interview where you'd have to warn everyone ahead of time. It's unlikely, but possible. Um, for the, again, you have three most meaningful experiences. The total hours things really stresses people out. Just, just estimate. I mean, everyone, who, when you work a lot of these jobs, I mean, who knows how long you work? Just, just do your best. They're not going to double. They're not going to fact check you on that. Just try to be as honest as possible. Um, it can be really stressful to write these experience descriptions. Here's a general rule of what you should try to do. The three things you should focus on on first, what did you do? What were the responsibilities? What did that accomplish? And what was the impact? So, um, for example, think about like, you know, when you, when you volunteer some at a hospital, okay, my, as a volunteer at this hospital, here's what I did. And because of my efforts, here's what happened. And then at the impact um, can kind of think about things like, how did that affect you? Um, If you happen to do some research and you won an award for it or a scholarship, that would also count as impact. Um, But again, impact can also just be how it impacted you. So that's generally the format that you should try to follow and the things that you should try to cover in these descriptions to kind of 
prove that they were meaningful to you and that you should try to do for all of them, even ones that you didn't mark as the most meaningful. All right, that's what I have for work activities section. I know that's like a popular one to ask questions about. Do we have any more questions, concerns, complaints, et cetera? This is a question, and I think it may be from a counselor. I work with some pre-nursing students who insist on becoming a nurse before going to medical school. Are there any uh, are there many registered nurses going into medical school? Interesting. Um, at least in my class, I don't think there are any. We have some phlebotomists, um, EMTs. That's not uncommon. I think it just takes so much work to be a nurse. Um, so much time that it's not as common and you would just become a nurse practitioner. Um, I think what's more common is to do something short uh, that requires less training like an EMT or um, a phlebotomist and then go to med school. I've seen a number of people do that. Yeah, I, I could just say this is it's really, really hard because your nursing, like all the pre-nursing courses that you take do not transfer over to pre-med. So you got to you can apply to nursing school with like the chemistry uh, that you're taking for um, pre-med. You have to take a different set of chemistries. Mm -hmm. And so it's much harder. And once you're working as a nurse, like your hours and everything else is so much harder to go back. There are people that have done it. We actually have a speaker coming in July uh, 6th that actually was a nurse. And now she's a orthopedic resident. Uh, uh, and so she could talk, she was going to come and talk about how, how she did it and how much harder it was. So I would say like getting an EMT experience and certainly now with like so much shortages, mm -hmm. you could get an EMT and get a lot of clinical experience and make really good money than to spend, you know, because, and the other part of it too, with nursing is nobody is is hiring nurses that have AAs. You have to have a BSN. So you have a BSN, and if you want to take any of your pre-med classes, you got to take them as a post back, open enrollment, and you can't, and most of the UCs and CSUs don't offer second bachelor's either. So you can't go back and get a bachelor's in biology or whatever and apply. So, and and uh, Dr. Kazanjian is going to actually go over that as well. Um, why she decided to not become a nurse practitioner and, and, and go to medical school and how much harder it was for her. So come to that and uh, and I put that link in there and you can sign up as well. Sorry. Yeah, no, that was really helpful. So I've actually, uh, the other thing is they're not as uh, linear. Being a nurse is not all that helpful for becoming a doctor in terms of the schooling. I've taught a lot of nurses. I used to tutor nurses. Um, and you learn kind of different things. Uh, so it's a lot, there, there's a lot more procedurals and product, procedural things and protocols that you learn in nursing that wouldn't, I mean, you'd be an incredible doctor if you knew all those things, but you're not, they're not gonna, it's not gonna really help you out in med school. Um, so I don't, I would, I don't think I'd ever recommend for someone to go into nursing first. Now, if you happen to be in nursing and decide that you wanna become a doctor, it sounds like it's possible, um, but that's definitely, it sounds like a very hard track. Um, any other questions? Okay, we're gonna move along. All right, another section that causes a lot of anxiety, letters of evaluation. And this one I will say is really tough when you're a community college student and if you're transferring to a large UC. This one is a challenge. I hope um, there are people on this call who are listening early on because this one you want to start being strategic from day one after transferring. Um, so if you're a transfer student, before you transfer, you can have letters. You can have letters from your community college professors. I say can if you need a letter and there's a really good reason, but it's definitely discouraged. Ideally, you get them from a four-year university professor. I did have one um, professor from my community college write me a letter, but I actually, she didn't write it at, from a professor standpoint. I did a large project with her in some like community service. So she actually wrote it more from the lens of an extracurricular observer. Um, so let, let's talk about letters. Um, how many do you need varies. Not all schools have the same requirement. At minimum, you, 
minute, very, very, very minimum four, ideally six. Um, so the ones that are generally recommended is two science professors where you took a class for a letter grade, one non-science professor, because some schools actually want a non-science professor, um, someone who has observed you doing patient care, and then one to two extracurricular, extracurricular observers. The ones in orange are the ones that like, if you're bare, if you're doing the absolute bare minimum letters, those are the ones you need. Four and six are ideal to have, um, points four and six are ideal for a total of six. Um, when you, as soon as you transfer, it's really challenging. You have two years, that's two years less than the average student to try to make uh, contacts. And uh, most of the UCs are giant. And so it's very challenging to actually get to know any of your professors as opposed to some of the smaller schools. So here's some advice, and this is why I say start early. If you're doing moderately well in the class or you like a professor, right away start attending their office hours. That's your only chance to actually get to know the professor and try to attend them religiously. Even if you don't have a question, it's less about getting your questions answered and more about showing that you are invested in this class and making impression on the professor. So starting early doing that is the best way to do it. Um, try to talk to your professors. If you're thinking that you might get to ask for them for a letter, Try to talk to them about their research, like be genuinely interested in what they're doing always helps. Um, if you can get involved in their research, if you happen to have a science professor who is looking for undergrads in their lab, and that's like the best case scenario because then he can write you a dual or he or she can write you a dual um, science professor and research letter. But um, that's sometimes hard to pull off. I did not have that. Um, another tip is sometimes you'll be You'll realize like, oh, I still have two years to go before I even start my application. They're going to forget who I am. Yes, they're going to forget who you are, but there's a workaround that can work very well is you have them, you find some kind of scholarship application, even if it's a, for um, a scholarship you don't maybe have a chance of getting, but you have them write you a letter for that scholarship as soon as possible while they remember you. Because unfortunately they just, I mean, some of these classes are like 400 students, even if you went to office hours and they liked you at the time, in two years, that's a lot of students that have come through their office. Um, so if you ask them to write you a scholarship letter early on, and then two years later, like, hey, you wrote me a scholarship letter. I just so happened to need a letter for med school. Then, then it's really easy for them to look back and just kind of update it a little bit and send that. Um, so that's a little pro tip that works really, really well. Um, and then the important thing, whenever you ask a letter writer, if they can write you a letter, you always have to ask them um, to be honest with you and whether they can write you a strong letter. The last thing you want is a weak letter. And most letter writers, they're not, like, writing a letter is a commitment for them. And if they can't write you a strong letter, they're gonna tell you because they don't want, no, nobody wants to write a weak letter. It's too much work. Um, so it's a very important thing to ask and um, be upfront about. And it's very standard. I know it sounds awkward, but it's actually very standard. Yeah, it's really important to ask that if you could write me a strong letter. And if they say they can't, don't push them because I actually know somebody who writes a lot of letters of recommendation. And that person stated that when they specifically tell someone that I can't write them, and if they push for it, they're putting their signature to it and they can't lie. So they will say, you know, for example, Alexandra was a student in my class. She was really average. She was late half the time <laughs> and he actually wrote this for some people and and unfortunately you can't see what those letters are so uh and people are pretty honest like if you say can you write me a really strong letter recommendation for medical school and some people if they like you they would say absolutely i want to write that mm -hmm. a lot you know people think it's a great honor for them to be able yeah. to do that if they like you and they think that you're a person that they want to put their name to it on paper. Yeah. Um, the, actually, so a, a tip that in med, in med school, like right now I'm getting letters for um, my residency application. And then sometimes you're in a position where you're working with someone on a research project. And actually like in med school, they advise us when we're asking for research letters and we have a week to impress someone, you actually talk to them early on and just explain to them, hi, um, as you know, I'm applying to whatever residency med school. I really want to earn, and the key word is earn a strong letter. Will you please let me know what I can do 
um, you know, please give me advice. I want to improve. I want to do as um, as well as possible. So depending on the situation, you can also be pretty upfront with um, people. A lot of times they won't be surprised. If you're a pre-med doing research in a lab, they know you want a letter. That's pretty clear. Um, and it's like, it, it's uncomfortable. Everyone hates asking. Trust me, I'm in the middle of this right now. We hate asking, um, but it's expected. Um, and sometimes it can be um, good depending on the situation to be proactive and just let them know that you are working and you want to earn it. You don't want to just get it. You want to earn it. Um, so important verbiage. Yeah, I would say uh, Alexandra was very like hit it on the nail. Is how do you earn a strong letter or recommendation? Because you don't want to just get something and people don't want to just give something. But if you earn something, then uh, and I think you get a way better result when you say that. All right, that's my spiel on letters evaluation. Start early, guys. It's really hard when you're in the community college and UC system. It's really hard not to scare you, but this is the one section where you want to be very, very proactive. And it's a section that a lot of people get stressed about and leave to the last minute because of that. So that's why I'm harping on it. All right, med schools. This is where you start spending insane amounts of money. I'm sorry, sorry, just one more question. Just to clarify, would it be acceptable to have a letter from community college professors? Yeah, so acceptable, yes. Advise, there's there's good and there's, so unfortunately prestige matters a little bit. So a PhD, someone who has a PhD in their university matters slightly. Now, if it's a super strong letter, um, it's all weighing, it, it, there's no perfect answer. Ideally avoid unless they're, if it's for a class, because you have opportunities to take science classes um, when you transfer. So again, ideally avoid it from a community college because they're going to look at if this person, it, it's unfortunate, but if this person is at a big, well-renowned institution, they'll take that letter a little more seriously. I've looked into this. I think it's ridiculously unfair. They often don't know you very well. It's just, there is a bias towards that. Now, again, if this letter is gonna be super strong and it's coming from a community college, then maybe weigh, weigh your options. But ideally in a perfect world, um, try to avoid community college letters or what you can do, um, which is what I did, is you can, if you happen to you know, work with that professor in community college on a project, then it doesn't count as a science letter. It counts as an extracurricular letter and you can have them write it from that lens. Yeah, I personally think community college professors write way better letters of they recommendation. Do. They do. And so I would say to be smart, use them as your third letter or a professional. So I know like if you're doing tutoring with them, if you are doing a project or if you're doing like an, a TA for them and stuff like that, um, absolutely use that as well. Mm -hmm. But you always want to, kind of, it's kind of like a briefcase. Like you want to have, this briefcase with you to and so if you get to know a community college professor really well and you have a letter from them that shouldn't stop you from doing it when you transfer or a UC professor but you also had practice for a year or whatever with this community college professor so they're pretty much most of the community college professors that I've had all had PhDs so they're not less academically than somebody teaching, they just choose to teach there. Matter of fact, my organic chemistry professor taught at a four-year university and hated it. So he came to the community college because he was a former community college student himself. So um, so you've already had that practice because they're like, there's no difference between the community college professor and the UC professor. They're all educated. The only difference is the community college professor only focuses on teaching where at the UC they focus on research and teaching and usually research takes a bigger chunk of it and so but they, they, their characteristics and their personalities are all the same there's not going to be you know any different so you already have a good practice with your community college professor to to do that so I would say yes if it's a really good one get it and if you're lucky and um, and get two from your professor after you transfer at UC, then great. Yeah, it's, it's, an, it's, it's very unfortunate. It's something that definitely frustrates me. Um, there is, you know, there are still anti-community college biases in a lot of schools, 
um, they're definitely trying to move away from that. Um, so it's, it's, it's unfortunate, but it does exist. I'm just saying it because it's a really unfortunate part of reality. So again, I think it's great if you can, if you have a letter that's incredibly strong, use it. Um, but ideally try to get to science professors as well um, from your four year community college. It's, it's an unfortunate system. And it's one that I know a lot of people in medicine are working really hard, myself and Jobin included, are trying really hard to change the system, um, but it, it takes time, unfortunately. We, sorry, we have another uh, question about letters. Someone asked, so it would, would it be recommended to have a non-science university professor letter over a science community college professor letter? And would a physician's letter be preferred over community college as well? So um, a lot of schools, when you look at them and you'll have to, I'll talk about this later, you'll have to look at the websites usually to confirm things, but different schools have different requirements. Um, so some of them, specifically, basically the most important thing is you follow their requirements. So if they specifically ask for two science professors, you submit two science professors, even if your non-science professor letter is better. Um, so that's, this is right here. These six are the possible options that they could ask. Most don't ask for six, most ask three to four letters, um, but there's different combinations of these six possible letters they could ask. So some ask two science and one, rant, uh, one anything else. So I'm asked for one science, one non-science, and one other letter. Um, so this is just the minimum you could have. Or, or this is these these six should get you into most schools. If you have these six letters, if you only have four of them, you'll get into. It, it'll qualify you for a lot of schools, not most, but a lot of schools. Um, so your question about is it better to have this or that? Um, it'll it'll depend what the school's asking for. If they're asking for two science letters and you don't give them two science letters, they're not gonna be happy because that school wa specifically wanted two science letters, if that makes any sense. I don't know if that answers the question. Yeah, and we had actually a talk from the director of admission of one of the schools. And the usually the dean um, is kind of like the last layer of the person but like a director of admission or some of the admission people, they're like the first layer. And she says that you would be surprised how many applications get thrown out because people don't follow instructions. So if a school says specifically on the, on the instruction, they're not joking. It's not a suggestion. They're not like, they, this is what they exactly want. And if it's not exactly what you give them, they will throw out your application and it's and it's a really unfair and cruel world but when they got 7500 applications they're looking for ways to eliminate people applicants you know and that's just a cruel world it is and so it's you know it's not one thing that's going to replace the other it's what they exactly are asking for and and yeah. and alexandra could say that in medical school the same exact way right <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, not I'm not justifying it at all, but the reason they get so upset when you don't follow their instruction is it sends a signal probably unintentionally for on, on the student's part that you are less interested in their school because you did not specifically follow their requirements. So the most important thing is to always look like you read through their website, you are committed to the school, you know exactly what they're looking for and all their requirements. Um, so that's why they get so sensitive about it. Um, but it is really unfortunate because it's just, it, it does throw out a lot of letters. Yeah, and I think somebody else, one of the deans mentioned this, but it also sends a, a signal to them that on the wards, you know, if, for example, they say, I want you to give this patient, you know, this much potassium, you have to follow what exactly said. It's not, oh, I've heard 50% of it. And so that's how a lot of them, people that are on the admission committee that are on the clinical side, that's how they take it, is that we put these definite instructions out on our website and exactly want, and you're not following that. So what else are you not going to follow if we tell you X, Y, Z on a patient care, then? Yeah. All right. Is that it for letter of evaluation questions for now? We can come back to it at any point. So let's move along. Um, so applying and choosing your med schools. 
best advice here is to apply broadly. There's a lot of resources to help you look at what med schools are out there, what their requirements are. Um, MSAR is a very popular one for sorting through schools. It um, is a website, uh, full disclosure. I didn't know about it when I applied. In a lot of ways, I, I didn't, I, I was not the best pre-med, but it is, um, I've heard amazing things about it. It has like all the information, most of the information you could want about a school. It does not, um, I would not use it in replace in place of checking all the websites because it, there could be mistakes in MSAR. Um, so we still recommend you check, especially the schools you're most interested in their website to make sure you're meeting all the requirements. But it also MSAR will tell you not just what the requirements are for that school, but also what their um, most recent classes look like. What's the average GPA? What's the average MCAT score? So you can kind of get a sense. When I say apply broadly, apply to schools with average GPA way below yours, above yours, same for MCAT score, try to be um, really broad in what you apply to. Um, if you only apply to the top schools, you could be really disappointed and have wasted a lot of money. Um, so again, I mentioned earlier, I uh, think 20 schools around in the 20s is a good limit. Um, the problem is there is another round of applications, which I will get to. Um, they are exhausting. It's a separate application for every school. And uh, if you apply to more than 20, they're all going to come at once and you won't have time to finish. So you'll probably just end up wasting some money. Um, so just something to think about. Um, talking about cost at this point, um, the primary app costs, at, at least when I look last, 170 for the application for your first med school. Every med school after that costs um, 39. But that's not all the money you're going to pay. Uh, when they send you a secondary application, you actually pay approximately 100 again. Uh, so it's really costly. And the reason I'm bringing this up is uh, there are fee, there's an AMC fee assistance program, and I'll talk about that in a second, um, that um, you should definitely apply for because it can be a really big deal. Um, so here's an example of what MSAR looks like. Um, you can see the schools, they'll tell you how many like out-of-state uh, applicants they um, take in, et cetera, application deadlines, how many people are in their class, just a lot of really good information. Um, it's not, it's relatively cheap by like, once you've spent how, God knows how much on MCAT and everything else at this point, $28 for a one year, one year subscription is pretty worth it. Um, fee assistance program will cover this as well. Um, staying organized during this process is really important. Um, this is just an example of my friend's uh, spreadsheet. She was an MSTP, so MD, PhD candidate. Um, so she was also keeping track of that, but having your own list where you copy from, because um, MSAR is kind of overwhelming, there's too much data, but you copy the most important things about the schools, what their letter of recommendation requirements are, various things like that. Again, double check each school's website. Make sure you have their course requirements. Going back to that, one of the earliest slides with the course requirements, some of them will recommend or require biochemistry, which means you need to have biochemistry or don't waste your money on that school because they're not gonna, that, that's just an ex, again, going back to the letter thing. If you don't have that one requirement that that school specifically wants, not worth applying because it's sending the wrong message to school, you're not a good fit. Um, because that's just an easy way for them to say, ah, Good, got rid of one application, 7,499 7, to go. Um, so unfortunately they are looking for reasons to disqualify people just because they've got an insane volume of applications. So check the requirements, check the letter of rec, um, and then try to keep it all organized so you know what schools you're applying to, which ones you wanna prioritize. Um, AMC fee assistance program, I've talked about it already a couple times, mentioned it. It helps with MCAT registration fees. MCAT's hundreds of dollars, it's expensive. Um, it waives up to 20 schools, um, the fees for 20 schools, which is huge, um, and two year MSAR subscription free. So definitely worth looking into. It's um, about it's about 20, I think it comes out to like $2,800. <laughs> yeah, it's so. Huge. If you have twenty eight hundred dollars and you want to spend it, give it to me, <laughs> and then I'll apply. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, almost done, guys. Hope you're hanging in there. I know there's it's a lot of information. Um, personal statement: 
uh, this is also uh, can be pretty stressful, but I actually think this is one of the more fun parts. This is where you really get to show off who you are. Um, I will talk about it a little more, but one thing to note, this you have this essay section along with your work activity section. So I think a common pitfall in personal statements is it people turn it into a resume. You know, uh, I've done this for this long. I've done that for that long. I also thought this was really cool. I did this. That's not what they want here. That's your work activity section. But your personal statement is, is to highlight why you want to go into med school and then pull in a couple of your work activities experiences to kind of highlight why you're such a great candidate, why you're interested, but don't rehash your work activity section. Um, this one is supposed to be a little more creative and just uh, flow like a story. Don't try to squeeze as much information in um, if it's not nicely flowing. Um, other things is just uh, general advice. This will not likely not make or break your, uh, well, this will likely not make your application. It could break it if you're too strange in your personal statement. So generally speaking, vague, um, Try to not be too odd or edgy and you're okay. I think there's a lot of stress about this, but it, I don't think it actually usually makes the application. It's just a nice thing to include. But if you say something controversial, you don't come off well in your personal statement, it could break your application if that makes any sense. Um, how to write this. Um, brainstorming before you're writing is super important. Uh, I have a strategy that I use where I take a blank piece of paper and I list out, I like basically look at my work activities section, I write all those out, and then I think about who I am, like my childhood, things that are key events in my life, I write those out too, and then I begin um, looking for themes and ways that I can string things together into a nice cohesive story. So let me show you what I mean by that with my own uh, personal statement at the time. So, okay, here's my sheet of paper. What are we thinking? Um, so random facts about myself, just start randomly laying them out. So I'm a, a military child. I, um, my nationality is half Ukrainian. I spent a lot of time in a third world country or a second world country. Um, my grandma had a lung disease and I spent a lot of time um, watching her really suffer and with no way to help her. Uh, I, in my pre-med years, I uh, did research in um, infectious disease when I shadowed a pulmonologist for a bit. What else did I do? Oh, in med school, I learned things about uh, social determinants of health and how where you live, what your zip code is, can really influence what your chances are of a healthy life. Um, I worked as a caregiver. So again, you can kind of see what I'm doing. I'm just randomly listing out facts. I tutored. And then... Once you have this array of things that you did, you start looking for, link, for links. So, oh, my research was in lungs and so was my shadowing. Um, I spent time in a second world country and I know that I could see there that the life expectancy was shorter and that the fact that their social determinants of health really affected um, them. What else? My grandma was in that country and I personally experienced it. And so you can see that, oh, and then I guess also like Ukraine was that country. So I'm, you can see I'm kind of trying to string together a story. And so to med school, I'm pitching that because of my experiences as a child, spending a lot of time in a second world country, helping my grandma, that made me interested in pursuing um, medicine and made me interested in research. My research further informed these decisions. And this is why you want me as your, as, this is why I make a great med school applicant. That's what you're doing. Now notice a couple of things here. There's experiences and there's things that I did in my work activity section that are not included here. The important thing here is that you're making a nice story. The other thing is, uh, I'm going to be a pediatrician. So, you know, the whole pulmonology thing didn't exactly pan out. Don't worry. You're not like signing a license or an agreement that this is what you're going to do. You're making a nice story. Um, so, Again, this is something to be creative with. I know it's really overwhelming. Take a blank piece of paper, start thinking about it early. If you realize there's a gap, like, oh, it'd be really nice if I did this, this would make more sense. You know, if you have time and you're thinking about this early, get that research, you know, make sure you're actually interested. If it looks like you might be interested in cardiology, see what you can do to get more clinical experience. Um, that's my spiel on personal statements. Try to be creative with it, but not too creative if that makes any sense. Any questions about that? Okay, 
Moving on very briefly about the MCAT. It's my least favorite part. I don't like talking about it because it is, uh, I think I still get MCAT PTSD. Um, for MCAT, it's expensive. And I don't just mean the cost of the MCAT. If you can get the fee, wa the fee waiver, you're still spending a lot of money on practice tests, on the prep books. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind to help you cut down on cost. Um, Cause there's, I know, I know there are uh, seminars already about talking about the MCAT. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it. I'm mostly just gonna talk about ways that you can cut down on cost. Cause I think, I think it's a scam how much they make you spend on it. Um, work hard in your classes, is definitely the number one thing. If you're doing well in your classes, you're more likely to do well in the MCAT. It's, there's a lot of overlap, start studying early, especially the, there's a section called critical analysis Re and reasoning cars. Um, it killed me, and I mean killed me. That was definitely the worst part of the MCAT because um, you just have to get used to the way they ask questions. It's it's like SAT, ACT reading section on steroids. Uh, there are weird passages about puffins and islands and stuff, and you just have to get used to it. So start studying for that one really early. If you want to save a lot of money, check your local library. And I don't mean your school library because the schools are clever and they're not gonna have MCAT books because they just, they'd be gone if they did that. And I'm, I think, I'm sure the MCAT book publishers don't want uh, universities to have their books because then they won't sell as many. But your local libraries get a ton of MCAT books uh, donated to them. I remember uh, I used UCSF. I don't know about other libraries, but I know San Francisco Public Library has like an entire four shelves of MCAT books. And so you'll save hundreds of dollars if you just check them out from a local library. I don't think many people know about this because I could check those book, books out for months at a time because I could just renew it over and over. So if you want to save a noticeable amount of money, check your local library. Um, take a psychology class. I mentioned that early on. Psychology is, there's a sociology, psychology has its own section in the MCAT. Uh, it's super high yield. And I'm, I know people who haven't taken it seriously and have failed the MCAT multiple times because you have to pass every individual section. And it was tragic. They had super high grades on everything else. So psychology really matters for this. Uh, practice tests really matter. This was definitely my pitfall, my biggest pitfall when I took the MCAT. Um, taking practice, they have a specific, specific way they like to ask questions. You just, you're not going to do as well if you don't take practice tests and they're miserable and they're long and you feel terrible about yourself. That is the way to study. And unfortunately, when you get to med school, you're going to find out that's how you study for med school. Last year, I didn't crack open a book all year to do well on my tests. I literally just did practice tests at the end of every shift, every day. Um, that's it's unfortunately the way that the educa uh, medical education is heading. And lastly, if you have a chance, tutor, physics, chemistry, biology, keep those subjects fresh. Uh, you can make a fair amount of money doing that. And you're, again, keeping those subjects really fresh in your mind. Um, I think, we, do we have any comments, questions about MCAT? Okay. Good luck, guys. It's not a fun part. It's definitely, in my opinion, the worst part of this whole application, but you'll get it over with, you'll survive. Um, it's an experience. Okay, that was the entire application. We made it through. All right, just very briefly, I'm gonna talk about what happens after you submit your primary application, because, oh wait, you're not done yet. So secondary applications, I've alluded to them a couple times. <laughs> so what it is, is um, once you send off your primary application, if you're a decent candidate, most schools are gonna send you a secondary application. That is their own personal application. And- um, Can I just add something? Oh, please. Most, some schools will also just send you a secondary to make a hundred bucks. Exactly, yeah. I, I was just getting to that. Um, and this is why I said, if you're, any like most most of them won't like yeah some of them will send you just automatically most of them do some very basic screening of like gpa maybe before they send you but yeah it makes them money they get a hundred bucks every time you submit a secondary so you're gonna get swarmed with secondaries um this is like secondaries are a specialized application for that school they can literally ask you anything and i mean anything Tell me a time where you advocated for someone. Um, have you done research? Tell me a situation where um, you were doing something challenging or where you failed. What did you learn from failing? 
Um, what does it mean to you to give back to your community? Uh, did you take a gap year? What did you do? Values, what are your values? Like there's a million and one questions. Some of them get really creative. Like <laughs> one of my, there's a couple schools that are just notorious for being creative. I think Duke and USC, I didn't even finish their application. I just said, I'm gonna eat the money on the primary because I cannot, there's no time. And these are just too bizarre. They had questions about like, if you had a superpower, what would it be and why? Or write a sentence and then that's not true and tell us why you wish it was true. Like some of them get really weird. Fortunately, most of them are kind of, there's a lot of overlap. There are gonna be a lot of questions about describe a challenge in your life. And obviously you already mentioned why medicine in your primary, they might ask you a little bit more about that. Um, so the most important tip that I would give you for secondaries is when you're writing your secondaries, make a giant Word document where you copy and paste everything you've ever written for a secondary. Um, so I would copy and paste the prompt and what I wrote. They're all gonna have different uh, Word requirements and limits, um, but you're gonna notice some patterns. And by the end, I, I kind of had most things already written. I had a 40 page long document of all, everything I had written. And I just copy and would paste pieces from other applications. Um, so that's my biggest advice for this, usually when you get a secondary, you want to reply within a week. Um, so, and they, and they do tend to come kind of come in a swarm. So just be ready for that. It is an exhausting time, um, but unfortunately it's just part of the process. Um, you can start pre-writing early. A lot of schools, if you Google, um, there are a lot of sites that have last year's questions and a lot of times they don't actually change. Uh, the prompts. So you can start pre-writing early, you know, what were USC's questions last year? Oh, look, yeah, that's really bizarre. I better write that one early. Um, if you have time, start pre-writing early. And again, keep all your, um, keep all your responses on a Microsoft Word doc. So you can start, um, you know, just slightly tweaking them to fit the word limit. Also make sure that uh, there is no um, spelling errors. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, some schools read them more than others. UCSD, actually, their prompt was to write, and I kid you not, an autobiography about yourself was the prompt. It was giant. I think the, the limit for it was like two full pages, single spaced. Um, but they, I will say UCSD reads it and, they, and it matters. And honestly, as a community college student, this section is where we get to shine because oftentimes we have a lot of experiences. We've done interesting things with our life. And um, this is, if schools that take this part seriously are looking at you in a more holistic way. So this part actually is, even though it's a pain, it's really helpful for um, non-traditional students. Okay, briefly, I'm gonna just touch on interviews because this is hopefully in the future for a lot of you. There's two types of interviews in med school. Different schools have different interview um, patterns. Some of them do a traditional interview and that's exactly like what you think when you think about an interview. Tell me about yourself, why medicine, those kind of questions. Um, there's this fun thing though, well fun, I'm gonna put in air quotes, that um, a lot of schools are starting to adopt. It's called the multiple mini interview. UCSD is one of these schools. Um, it's this interesting new format where you're gonna be interviewed uh, by six to eight different doctors. What they do is they send you into like a hallway with a whole bunch of rooms. You go, you open up um, an envelope. It's gonna give you a prompt. You got 30 seconds to think of answer the prompt, walk into that room and press the doctor for five minutes, leave and move on to your next prompt. And those prompts will usually be something entirely random, not related to you. So things like, is it ethical for a doctor to strike? When, when not? Uh, if you could have a superpower, what would it be and why? Um, Name five adjectives that you would use to describe yourself. Sometimes uh, some of them are related to like healthcare ethical dilemmas, which are fun. You know, like, oh, um, a 16 year old girl is a minor, but she's pregnant. What would you do? And, you know, she, her parents want an abortion, she doesn't. Or, you know, there's just, they get, they get, they get creative. Um, my best advice for preparing for the MMIs is practice, practice, practice. Uh, a lot of times you can watch medical ethics videos online. You know, they're not expecting you to be an expert on medical ethics. They just want to see what your thought process is. So when you answer these questions, be like, yeah, this is, acknowledge, this is a really complicated situation. It's tough. 
I think what's important, you know, you can use a little bit of basic medical ethics. There's a few principles of medical ethics, you know, patient autonomy, justice, uh, beneficence, non-maleficence is like the four key principles. You know, I think here's the, here's the dilemma, you're weighing um, someone's autonomy uh, or like another classic example would be um, someone who's diagnosed with an STD and they don't want their partner to know, but their partner probably has that STD. So what do you do? And then you're weighing patient autonomy to, and their right to privacy with um, the, the benefit with um, potentially hurting another person who's also your patient. So you're gonna mostly, they don't necessarily want you to give an answer. They want to see your thought process and that you realize and acknowledge it's a difficult situation and what you would do in that situation. So again, you don't have to be an expert. They, everyone is squirming during these and stressed and like they're, they just wanna see that you're a halfway decent person, that you know a little bit about medicine and that you're kind of, that you're committed. There's no right or wrong answer, but there's right. how you answer, how, but exactly. the process. Um, the other thing is that also don't be like one of the big things about MMIs is don't be an absolutist. Like, for mm -hmm. example, like abortion, like you can't just say, oh, well, you know, you, you know like very controversial topic, yeah. abortion, suicide or patient suicide. You got to like present both sides of the, the arguments and then say, well, I understand like this side comes from this way this side comes from that way, but I personally believe in this. And so you're not on the fence, but you're presenting both sides with like very unbiased because that's what you have to do every day. Like, you know, will you take care, like set, will you take care of someone who just committed murder? Or if, you know, this is another one, uh, there's one operating room and you have two patients that are, critically injured um, one of them is a 70 year old man he was a nobel laureate at your university the other one was a 17 year old who came into the lab and shot him who would you take to the operating room and why and you got to come up with these like really ethical so um these are like there's no right, right or wrong answer but you have to make those decisions and how you make those decisions and the process of it so like reading a lot of like there's a lot of good books on medical um on medicine also like uh guande's better um there is um uh, pathologies of power that's like a really good one by paul farmer um so there's a lot of these like really good books that they're fun to read there's another one too is um how doctors think by Jerome uh, Gropman, I think his name is. That's a really good book. And um, and you don't need to like read them and take notes. I listen to a lot of audiobooks when I drive because I got an hour driving mm -hmm. each day when I go to work. And so um, if you could listen to audiobooks, there's some podcasts as well on medical ethics. So there's a lot of things that you can do. And it's a, I think medical and MMI, um, the person who actually came up with it is a professor in Canada, and he said that it's about like uh, the process of it's like deductive reasoning. I think that's what he called it, but he just says that how people think and how you process something. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. There are a lot of YouTube videos also about like kind of if you don't have time to read books, which those sound like amazing books, I'm looking forward to reading them. Thank you for that advice. But if you just need like quick tips, there's a lot, there's a lot of resources out there. This is mostly, this is not telling you how to do it this is mostly just to give you an fyi that this you may see this and you actually do want to prepare for these all right this last we're pretty much we're at, we're at the home 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 strike oh my gosh um we're almost there home stretch last very quickly so you made it to med school congratulations what is med school um very briefly there's a lot of theories about what med school is like um everyone has a different opinion. I just want to reassure you that studying and piling ourselves in books or now it's just iPad and up-to-date articles is only part of what we do. Um, this is what the structure of med school looks like. First two years, and this is this does vary a little bit between schools. There's a lot, schools have a lot of uh, individual uh, autonomy in their schedule and everything, but generally speaking, first two years are more uh, of the learning, book learning, but um, not just, I guess, this is the, what is it? Uh, 
oh, I'm losing the thing. But anyway, this is where you do the bulk of your like clinical learning in the first two years, but it's not just in books. There's a lot of simulations. Anatomy lab is very, um, most schools have an anatomy lab during these two years. So you, you study a lot, you learn a lot. A lot of schools now have pass no pass tests during this time. So the only thing you're really studying for is step one exam. Then your third year is like the uh, most exciting and most challenging part of med school, but it's the most memorable. Everyone, most physicians talk very fondly about their third year. It's where you go and you rotate through all the major departments of the hospital, uh, surgery, pediatrics, ge uh, general medicine, OB-GYN, uh, psychiatry, and plus or minus neurology if they split that one separately, uh, maybe emergency medicine. But you, you, sh you rotate through all the different major departments, kind of get a sense of it before you have to make a decision what you want to do. And then fourth year, which is where I am now, I just started a week ago, is where you make a decision or are in the process of making a decision what you're going to apply to. And you're doing a few specific rotations in that field in preparation for applying to residency. Once you apply to residency, you do a couple of fun electives and you have a lot of time off. It's, I'm looking forward to it. I hear it's, it's pretty fun. Um, so that's med school in, in a very brief nutshell, the schedule. Um, just wanted to end with, I know this is like overwhelming. If you, please be careful with some of like Reddit posts, et cetera. It's really like you, you read people who like essentially are, have done five years of research, published four publications, and they're still like freaking out about how to get into med school. You don't need to do all those things to get into med school. There's a lot of like rumors out there. It's hard, don't get me wrong, but it's also possible. And I know if you're on this call, a lot of students on this call, myself included, come from slightly untraditional backgrounds. And I wanna say that there are a lot of efforts. Uh, medicine is realizing that we need more diversity and inclusion. And there are a lot of efforts to try to make it more possible for students like us to um, get into medical school. And so I, want, I don't want you guys to get discouraged just because there's something, you know, you're not the most average pre-med uh, pre candidate. That also can be a strength. Um, I know D Dr. Dean Galuma is the Dean at our medical school and he um, was, talking here and he has a great um from community college to medicine and this this whole uh pre-med cc is really an amazing group of people who are um, trying to remind you that it is possible it's a lot of work <laughs> don't get me wrong it's a lot of work but it's possible um, so don't get discouraged it's a marathon um, but it's absolutely worth it in my opinion at the end it's you're going to learn so much uh, as a person. It's an incredible job. It's an honor to do every day. So if this is something you're interested in, you can do it. It just might take a while. Um, good luck to all of you. I'm really excited to uh, be colleagues with you in the future. And I... I'm actually at the hospital right now, so I have about 10 minutes uh, for questions before I have to run back. <laughs> I have some kids that are waiting for me, so. Okay, the first question that came up was, does the school you attended for undergrad matter when it comes to applying to medical schools? Will it put you an advantage or a disadvantage? Yeah, that's a good question. It depends on who you ask. You know, with this thing, you know, there are prestige matters somewhat, I mean, uh, it's not an absolute. There are students from all different schools and my med school. If you're coming from a more prestigious school, it can help. Um, but if you're coming from a less prestigious school, it doesn't take away your chances. It, dep it obviously depends on what kind of applicant you are, what you're bringing. It's, this is a holistic application. It's, it's not gonna make or break you on that one point. Um, it, it'll just depend, it's hard to answer. Yeah, and actually the UCLA Dean of Admission gave, you know, gave us talk and I put the link in the chat and she spent a good 12 to 15 minutes talking about that one question. She talked about her own journey and everything else. And so people, diversity matters when those people that are on the decision making come from very diverse backgrounds. So I put that link on there. You could go listen to her talk because we can't... Uh, I can't do it justice, and so go listen to it. Yeah. If you have the opportunity and are willing and got accepted to a school that's better than the other, that should be a factor in your consideration of it. You know, it is better, but not required. I would say there's more UCLA, UC Berkeley students 
in our class than other school, other UCs, but there's a lot of students who went to other UCs are, and are there. So it, it really, it depends on who you are as an applicant. The next question is, I heard that students should take the MCAT only one time when you feel you are most confident multiple times taking the MCAT is not considered good. Is this true? Um, I mean, again, it depends on your overall story. Obviously it's better if you take it once. Um, can you take it twice and get in? Yes. I don't know if Joe and you have some more. Um, no, I think we had like 13 deans of admission to talk about that. All of them said, second time it's good but after the second time they start to question your um they start to question if you're really serious about this because taking the mcat is a big time commitment um uh alexander can you say how much time did you spend studying for the mcat yeah, personally not enough <laughs> yeah but, okay. and yeah, and, and Trinity is spending significant amount of time. So it's a commitment, and it's your commitment to say, how bad you want to be a doctor? And so, after, I mean, people, a lot of people take it once and don't do well, take it a second time. But after, like, the third time, they're, they're going to start questioning if you're really committed to this. And so um, take practice exams. That's what those practice exams are for. They're not recorded. You could take them as many times as you want. Every time you take the MCAT score, the medical school will see it. And so if you got a, you know, 500 and you get a 515, well, yeah, you, you shown that you've improved significantly. But let's say you get a 510 and you decide to take it again and you get a 505 or 500, then that's a, that's a, so you're increasing all of those risks. And so take a lot of practice exams as you can. And that's what every Dean of admission said. You only want to commit this to take it once because you have to commit time and money because you have to pay for these practice exams, maybe a course you're not working. So you're not generating money and income. And unless you're wealthy that you could live off of support from externally so do not take it more than i mean basically it's kind of like one of those uh you know sh there's a song it was like shoot your shot or whatever like you want to put like you want to be ready to do this this is not like something like oh i'm going to take it and do not take it as a practice to say oh i'm going to see how i'm going to do and then i'll take it so it's a it's a bad thing you could do it's not like the sat or anything else so do it once and do it well. Okay. Um, maybe second time. Um, but you could also, like, let's say you wake up that morning and your dog got run over and your cat was eaten by coyotes and you got in a car accident taking, you know, on the MCAT. And when you walked into the MCAT office, somebody punched you. Don't take the exam. Like, you could not take the exam. If something happens that day, you could take it at another time. I've also heard of people, like, they start taking the exam and they're like really feeling anxious and they don't feel like they're doing well, you could actually cancel your, your exam and your score so it doesn't record. So there's all of these things you could do, but once you submit, you're kind of done. So take, take that. Yeah, so I, I will mention like it, these, it's really, it's, it's hard um, as students. Um, these tests are really challenging and you know, not all of us are good at taking these under pressure time tests. It seems incredibly mean that they make us do it. Um, but the reality is medicine um, does put you under a lot of pressure. When you have someone coding in front of you, you have to make these really stressful decisions. You have to know a lot of information. And so it's, it's mean, but it's also like, it's a good practice. These tests, learning how to do them are really good practice for your career. Um, and if this is something that it's really hard for you and it, you're, it just, it, you don't feel good doing it, it's not comfortable, like it's a good chance to think about maybe, maybe uh, a PhD or a research or something else would be a little bit better for you. Like it's, you know, um, it's, it's something that you should just consider. It's really unfortunate. Occasionally people get into med school, um, they, they kind of just made it in with their test scores and um, there's, there can be really difficult situations where you spent three 
years worth of medical costs. It's a ton of money. You spent so much money and you're not able to pass all the tests or you don't get into a residency. And that's like the worst. So I know it seems like they're being uh, admissions officers admissions deans and all that are being really mean by cutting you off at like a certain test score but the problem is it's such it's kind of it's a stressful job and the last thing you want is to spend a whole bunch of money and a whole bunch of time three years worth of your life practicing for something that you're not going to enjoy later on because it's really stressful or um, that you're not going to pass the final tests so um, I think when you take these tests if you're finding that like you're nauseous you can't do it you your test scores are not good and you hate being under this amount of pressure, there's a lot of great career opportunities. You're smart, you got, it, you got this far, maybe there's something else that you wanna consider that's not medicine. So it's just, it's a good, it's really hard to talk about as someone who also struggles with taking tests. It's something that I try to be really honest with myself about, um, but it, it does happen. People get into med school and don't make it all the way through or don't go in to get into residency and it's a horrible position to be in. Yeah, there's a ton of a better note. Yeah. yeah, and if you're and if you're like somebody like um Alexandra and myself and if English is not your first language, it's it's challenging, but also there's a lot of people that have gone through it that but you have to put in the time and effort and sacrifice and it, it is it is a sacrifice, but again, it's you know do you want to do something that you are going to enjoy for the rest of your life or you're not going to enjoy and, and part of taking tests. And so um, we've done a lot of things on study skills and test taking. There's, I think we've got like five or six workshops that you could take a look at it, but there's a lot more information out there that you can do to become a better test taker. One of the biggest things you could do to be a good test taker, and certainly if English is not your first language is reading, just read, um, newspaper read the new york times washington post and these are all free and you don't have to spend hours just like i read the washington post and new york times and i commit 20 to 30 minutes a day to it and it's just a quick read i could do it on my computer or on my phone i do it like when i'm waiting in line for something or when i'm uh, just quick stuff you could just read and you would be surprised how your test taking ability abilities increase obviously reading tmz blog is not that but like i'm talking mm -hmm. about like like washington post new york time um scientific american things that are like uh, the economist like these are like really hard written and and people that write these tests come from east coast elite and this is what i'm saying elite in terms of like elite not like snobby but elite in terms of like people that have like English degrees, writers, and they write very like systematic and complicated because that stuff is not going to go away. Your medical textbooks and your journals that you do a lot of your learning from are not are written in that language and in that tense. And so you could do it. It's just you kind of have to put the time and effort. Um, we got a couple more questions. Do you want to? Sure. Trinity? Yeah, the next one is when you were in community college, how did you balance uh, work and life or did you work? And if so, how many units did you take in order to transfer faster per semester or quarter? Oh, man, it's been, in all honesty, it's been a bit. It's been like six years. Um, I did work. I didn't work a ton. Um, I think most of my work was tutoring, which was nice um, because... I was able to review things while I tutored. Um, you know, I guess I feel I think it depends on your situation. I was I took three years in community college. Um, I think I took a pretty average amount of uh, units during that time uh, as a full student. Like I I don't yeah. I'm trying to remember like exactly what the question is. I feel like that part doesn't, that, that part's really individualized to you. It shouldn't matter so much how much time you take. Once you get to four-year college, um, there'll be more pressure to get out in a set amount of time. And at that point, you should probably try to get out in two to three years um, because it's really expensive. And just because 
most schools will let you stay long, but I don't think for community college, as long as you explain, you know, if you've spent five years in community college, but you were working, if you spent 10 years in community college, but you were working, as long as you can explain why, I don't think that should be a big issue. Yeah, the UCs, I think Berkeley wants to get you out in you five semesters. Out. Yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> they get you out. <laughs> yeah, and so that's where you literally cannot work and you have to spend all your efforts to, to take, you know, but... Uh, the thing is, like, I think the question, and I would address this, is that how many units did you take in order to transfer faster? Um, nobody gives you a cookie for finishing faster. It's how you get everything done and you keep your high GPA. Because I know somebody who spent two years at a community college and were really, like, focused on transferring. And that person ended up having a 3.1 GPA and didn't get in anywhere because they were just like taking um, 20 units, 21 units. Um, if you have to work in other things, like I work and I can't take more than two science classes a semester. I just can't. I don't have the physical. And if anybody doesn't, you know, and so it's going to take me longer to finish. But and it's just the way it is. But you got to get good grades and. You got to be able to transfer because, I mean, and the other thing is like UCs now are getting much tougher. And so if you don't have high GP, certainly in some of these majors that you're looking at, um, I mean, Alexandra had very good grades when she transferred and had good grades when she graduated. So you need to keep high grades. And so you could take 21 units and finish, but if you have a 3.0 GPA, you're not going to get into any of the UCs. Yeah. Um, the and so- the one thing I'd, I'd add, the only the only thing that would look bad is if you spend a long time, but you don't have a good explanation for it. So if you take a class, a class a quarter or two classes a quarter, but you're not working, that would look a little questionable. But as long as you have a reasonably busy life, you can prove that you're doing things. Yeah. I don't think there's a problem. Yeah, we did a workshop that a couple of, that was by five single moms. They were all single moms when they were pre med and in med school, and they. A lot of them took them a while to do it, but they were like raising a kid. And so, That's a good justification. Um, yeah. And so I think everybody like, so in terms of like, um, in terms of like how to manage everything is like, know thyself, like know your limitation. If you have to work to put a roof over your head, that's the reality of it. Not all of us are rich, you know, not all of us have won the lottery or have wealthy parents. And so just going to have to do, the best that you can and be able to just say in your, in your um this you application know. gives you sorry to interrupt i didn't realize you weren't done oh, no go ahead, go ahead but this application they make you write a ton of a reason they give you every opportunity they're, they're whole they're trying to be very holistic they give you every opportunity to explain why what decisions you made and why you made them um and that's really like i said that's actually really good for any student that's not just the traditional for your to high school to four year to, to med school. Um, so this is, it's a strength. You guys have real stories uh, usually. And so take advantage of that. Explain why you made the decisions you made, what happened. And usually that's the most important part. Do we have any more questions? Nothing else has come up in the Q and A. No. I know that you have limited time also. So if anyone has any more questions, please put them in now. If not, we'll let Alexandra go. While I give people a few seconds, again, I just wanna end on a positive note. This is um, being in medicine is a huge honor. It's really incredible. If this is something that you feel is your calling and you're really passionate about, um, you can do it. If it's something that you don't know that you want to do or you're not sure about, there are a lot of other cool things you can do. So don't feel pressured to do something you don't want to do. And if this is something you really care about, um, there are ways to get in. Like, even if you're not the perfect candidate, I can tell you half the stuff that I advised, I probably didn't do. Like, you know, try to do, you, you're going to try to do your best, try to do the stuff that is advised, but um, you have opportunities to explain your decisions and why um, your life is the way it is and usually it's out of your control and so um, don't be don't be ashamed of who you are 
and just like I said, if this is something you feel passionate about, you think it's your calling, I can tell you personally, I love it. It's amazing. You're going to work so hard. You're going to work harder than you've ever worked before. And I know like Jobin's in the medicine right now and uh, doing a lot of things. You're going to, the hours are insane, but if you really love it, it doesn't matter. So I wish you all best of luck. Like I said, I'm really looking forward to being uh, future colleagues. Thank you so much.